Thank you for inviting me. Um, so again, so I want to just maybe try and go through a few of the things Phil talked about, uh, but maybe like in a little bit more of a concrete way. He sort of like gave you like a huge um, overview of everything to sort of try and convince you that it was was interesting. Um, and I just want to try and uh, describe like something that you could that you could use it to do. Now it's not something that like that has been completely that we know how to do all the details, but I at least like want to try and describe like what the like what the program would be. So what I want to try and do is explain uh, what how one can mathematically describe the physicist's argument that the following two 3D n equals four theories are 3D mirror to one another. And the mathematical statement uh, that I'm going to take as my definition of 3D mirror, um, so both of these two theories are of the form uh, T star of some vector space mod G. I'll say exactly which vector space is in a few seconds. And this other one is a theory of the form also T star V mod G for a different vector space. And remember that the statement that Phil wrote for, our for like a conjecture of like a different way of stating symplectic duality than what had been st stated in the past is that one can look at the quasi-coherent sheaves on the space of Durham maps into one of these spaces or into the base of one of these spaces. And that that should be uh, the same as the category of D modules on the space of ordinary, sorry, I think he was writing his disk with an O like that, maps from the punctured disk into V shriek mod G shriek, and that these things should be identified, and then vice versa if I swapped, if I did Durham maps over here then I should get the uh, D modules on the, on the ordinary maps over here. So this is my statement for like what I mean by two theories that are both uh, correspond to cotangent bundles uh, being 3D mirror. Let me actually just emphasize one fact that Phil did not. Um, so this statement is a mirror symmetry of loop spaces. Right, so like, like one way of like thinking of this statement is that we're trying to say that symplectic duality, uh, like as formulated by um, Braden, Proudfoot, Lakata, and Webster, can actually be deduced from a more fundamental statement, which is a mirror symmetry of loop spaces. This is a B model on what I would call a Durham loop space. So basically, uh, and this is a A model on an ordinary holomorph, or on what I would call a holomorphic loop space. So if you only like remember one thing about this conjecture, it's that uh, symplectic duality, which I'm not telling you what the old conjecture was, um, there's a better conjecture which should be about mirror symmetry for loop spaces. And the important fact is that the Durham gets exchanged from being on the, so here these are sheaves with flat connections on ordinary loops, and then these are ordinary sheaves on loops that have to be flat with respect to some connection. Can I ask you an unknowing question? Uh, I, in your talk, are you going to distinguish uh, quasi-coherent sheaves from incoherent sheaves? No, uh, yeah, so basically, like, nothing that I'm going to do is smart enough to distinguish any functional analysis problems. Because basically, the physics isn't strong enough to, like, physical arguments aren't strong enough to answer uh, those sorts of things. And then, uh, in, like, the mathematical model of these physical arguments, uh, there are places where you get to make choices of, like, different functional analysis, and it can't tell you which ones to choose. Uh, so you have to do that manually 
uh, like by like actually checking cases. Um, so yeah, so basically it's, it's a problem with this. Um, it, this is like a, a thing that happens in ordinary geometric quantization that there isn't any like way to solve your functional analysis problems abstractly from a physical reason. Like you actually have to do real anal like analysis on function spaces in order to make things work. And similarly, the physics is not strong enough to do anything like that. I think in complete categories and physics, they don't talk each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like it's just not a. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, so nothing I'll say is smart enough to see that. Okay, but I'm actually like not going to go deeply into uh, an example of this statement. I'm going to try and describe a way that you can deduce statements like this from local Langlands. So you would have to prove some things in local Langlands first, and then it would let you get. So you're going to go in this direction. So I mean, I, I, I usually like to go in the opposite direction, going from this to local Langlands. Yeah. So maybe that's. So maybe I'm not going to buy myself anything. But, well, we'll see. Okay, so both of these two theories um, are both type A quiver gauge theories. Um, and so like what I mean by that is like when you write like some diagram like this, uh, what, you're what like a physicist means when they write some space like that is they mean some 3D theory whose um, fields are representations of some type A n quiver with dimension vectors v and w, and then the v's are the, uh, and you mod out by gl of the v's, so the v's are what they call the gauge nodes, and the w's are what they call the framing nodes, and then you take the cotangent bundle. And so any theory that's like of this form, where it's like a cotangent bundle of some vector space mod a group, we call these theories of cotangent type. Um, and for a while, I'm going to talk about these, but we'll have to, in order to do this, we're going to have to leave this class in a little bit. Um, yeah, so basically the, the vector space is often called the matter in the theory, and this uh, group GLV is often called the gauge group. Okay, so let me just tell you the physicist's proof, and then we're going to spend the entire rest of the talk just trying to understand what on earth this said. So the physicist's proof would be to say, like, take your quiver, turn it into brains. Then you use S-duality and it exchanges one kind of brain with another brain. You notice that the crosses are getting exchanged with the lines, with the vertical lines. And then they would say, there's something called a hanani witten move that lets you move brains through one another. And if you just do a whole bunch of hanani witten moves, eventually you'll end up with this um, weird configuration at the end. You could turn that thing back into a back into a quiver, and thus things are, these two things are 3D mirror to one another. Like, like that's what, and I remember the first time I ever heard this argument, I was Skyping with a tutor, we had just barely met, and I nearly threw my laptop, like, <laughs> like off the table, and uh, started shouting at him, but now I'm gonna say this argument to you. Sorry, uh, can I just ask a question? So, uh this whole thing is supposed to work only on some very strong assumptions. I mean, I mean yeah. So this is only going to work for quiver gauge theories. Yes, I mean, usually we're talking quiver gauge theory is not a quiver gauge theory, and so somehow, and uh, so so yeah, some, somehow secretly assuming that we have a quiver such that it is such that it is, for example, quiver of type A. So where exactly in this picture? Where exactly? Uh, it's only in this last step. So, so actually what we're going to do is we're going to learn how to make sense of the, of the mirror to quiver gauge theories that aren't, uh, that aren't of cotangent type, that aren't also quiver varieties. Like that's actually like the real point of the talk. Uh, but the, uh, so these, in, we'll, have to, we'll actually make sense of all these intermediate steps. And so that means you have to talk about theories which are not, um, which are not of quiver type. Um, but uh, in order to do that, there's a certain cate look category that you, have to that you have to find in the local Langlands category that once you find it, then like, you can make sense of all these pictures. OK, so let me just describe the first step to you. This part is like purely translation. Like, there's no math in this. It's purely like a dictionary. Um, and so let me just tell you the building block brains. So uh, these horizontal lines, if you have a stack of n of them, they call these things D3 brains. 
And the only important thing that you need to know about them is that they carry a copy of 4dn equals 4 super Yang Mills with gauge group GLN. And 4dn equals 4 is uh, the theory that geometric Lang lens is all about, and it's the one that uh, one of the ones that Phil was talking about uh, this whole time. Uh, and then the other two building blocks are called the NS5 brain and the D5 brain. And these are uh, interfaces between GLN and GLM super Yang Mills. And by an interface, uh, as Sasha like mentioned the other day, I just mean a boundary condition for the product, product theory. There's like a folding trick that lets you change one for the other. Okay, so these are my building blocks. And then now if I have a quiver uh, with uh, the dimension vectors V and W, then uh, the way that you put this thing together, oh, I was a little bit, um, I was a little bit not quite careful enough. Uh, so what you want to have is a pair of, um, yeah, a pair of, oh no, I was good. So you want to have like a pair of NS5 brains, those crosses, circles with a cross in them, for each uh, gauge node, so each of these nodes with a V, I in it, and then stretched between those two NS5s, you want to have V, I of the D3 brains. So like in my, bet in between my first two NS5 brains, I've stretched v V1 D3 brains, between the second two, I would stretch V2 D3 brains, so on until at the end, I would stretch Vn D3 brains. And then for each of my framing nodes, like so I have a framing node attached to this gauge node V1, then I would put Wi of the D5s. So, so right now I'm just telling us some recipe how to do I'm just telling you the recipe for like translating between a quiver picture and for these pictures. So there's no math here, it's just like what is the, uh, like, how, like how do physicists translate this picture? Can I just ask, so I should picture this as like R4 having some like 3D walls? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what's happening. Yeah, so what we're going to see is that uh, these, yeah, so you should think of the direction, um, you should think that there are um, two directions coming out of the board. Uh, like, so we're looking at everything from the perspective of these D3 brains, which are some four-dimensional objects, and you can see, um, Oh no, sorry, you should think of three dimensions as coming out of the board. So then at each of these uh, NS5 and D5 brains, you should think of three dimensions coming out. And so these things are gonna be 3D interfaces between a bunch of 4D theories. So you can see that when a physicist writes this thing down, I'm actually doing a lot of my talk a little early, uh, like what they're like trying to write down is you can build this 3D theory as a composition of, inter of, of interfaces. Like that's what they're telling you. And so if we can identify these building block interfaces, then like we would really um, be cooking with gas. Um, yeah, so, okay. So then uh, as Sasha was just saying, like not every brain configuration like actually comes from a quiver. Like basically if you were to draw this first brain configuration, uh, like you would notice that there's no NS5 brains in it at all. Um, and so like I don't know how to turn that thing uh, back. Uh, the other thing is when I was doing all of these, uh, the fi this physics argument, in my very first step, I took my quiver that corresponded, uh, sorry, took my set of brains that corresponded to this quiver and I did S duality to it. I ended up with this other weird looking quiver that kind of looks like a TIE fighter with like a lot of extra bombing pods or something. <laughs> and uh, and this one like does not correspond to any uh, to any quiver gauge theory because it has D5 brains just sort of hanging free uh, at the ends. And so the point of all these moves, uh, which like are actually like not necessary, but it's just like a good motivation, is to put this is that you can actually like change this for like equivalent configurations. Like you can basically slide interfaces through one another. Or there's some relations between interfaces. And then uh, if you use those relations, then you can turn this thing back into a, um, back into a quiver. So like if we reverse this recipe, you'll see that I should have three gauge nodes. Like I, ha I have 
you know, three spaces between my NS5s, so I should have three gauge nodes with a one, a two, and a one in it, which is what I wrote. And there's two D5s there, so there's two D5s here. <laughs> so then there's a framing node of two there. Okay, so the point is, is like these things like are not actually quiver gauge theories, um, and in fact, like they're not of cotangent type, like they're not, thing, they're not theories like these. Um, and so, uh, at the moment, like nobody really had like a very good way of, uh, of talking about these things. Uh, but at least for the type A ones, we'll be able to do it. Uh, but one thing that I will say is uh, these, these, th these configurations have actually been studied a lot under the name of like Cherkis bow varieties. So like, basically like the, uh, so Nakajima I think like always like puts in an extra mirror, but like the Higgs branches of these things are the, are the Cherkis bow varieties. Um, and, and so, uh, but, well, and also the Coulomb branch will be a different Cherkis bow variety. Um, but these Cherkis bow varieties, they're like he was literally trying to make sense of these pictures. Like that was literally the problem he, he was trying to solve and then he wrote down like some, some varieties that were supposed to be the Higgs branches for these, for these things. And like what these things look like, because I'm not going to talk about them very much more, is they're basically a mix of like a combination of quiver data like, like you've seen and then you also add some extra stuff about solutions to Nam's equations um, on like certain on certain intervals, and then you mix those two things together. Um, and like these D5 brains, like they end up being about Nam's equations. Like that's like the missing thing that we didn't have. Okay, so now like I want to know like can we interpret like the rest of that argument mathematically? Um, and so the answer is like. Yeah, you can try to, at least after you do a holomorphic topological or a topological twist, so then that puts you in the world that um, Phil was talking about earlier, where you have shifted symplectic geometry. And he talked about like how uh, boundary conditions were just Lagrangians and shifted symplectic stacks. And then, um, so yeah, so in particular, like we're trying to look for these um, these Lagrangians and the equation of motion for 4dn equals 4. Um, and then depending on which prob what problems I'm interested in answering, I might want to compactify that topologically twisted theory on either a curve, uh, either like a closed proper curve, maybe the bubble, like that's something that's like come up today, like Phil drew his bubble, um, where you take this thing and then glue them together along the puncture disk. Um, or possibly a, um, or possibly just a punctured disk. And so for this thing, uh, all the uh, the way that we found this conjecture was by compactifying on a disk. And so, like, for if I want to answer this question, I'm going to want to um, compactify on a disk. But there's actually like interesting questions in in global geometric Langlands that one can attempt to answer by looking on this thing on like a global curve. Uh, in particular, uh, BFN have dis defined some certain uh, uh, sheaves on the affine Grassmannian, and like if you want to globalize those sheaves to a global curve, uh, like you, then you would compactify on, on, on a global curve C instead of the bubble. Um, also, there's like the mirror to these sheaves, which nobody's described yet, um, that, that we'll give a description to. Sorry, I mean, th they know the mirrors on the bubble, but I mean like, like the global, um, the global case. Okay, so now what I want to try and do is just tell you a little bit about the twists of 4dn equals 4. So as Phil mentioned, uh, there's a holomorphic topological twist, and then there's an A twist and a B twist. Uh, but one subtlety is that um, there's actually two versions of the holomorphic topological twist. Uh, basically, they use the same supercharge, uh, but it turns out that you need to use different twisting homomorphisms depending on whether you want to deform. Uh, sorry, in 4D, there's no problem. You can use the Kapustin Witten twisting homomorphism and go to either A or B. But if you want to do a twisting compatible with a 3D theory on the boundary, then uh, the Kapustin Witten twisting homomorphism is not compatible. And so there are actually like two 
different twisting homomorphisms that you need to use. And depending on which, and one of them will let you deform to the A in, the, in 3D, and the other one will let you deform to B in 3D. Um, so like there's going to be some slight subtlety. So I've been talking all this time about like twisting homomorphisms, but let me just tell you what that means mathematically. The consequence you'll see of two different twisting homomorphisms is that the fields will be globalized differently. Like, so you need the twisting homomorphism to know how to move off of flat space to curved space. So basically, like, things will be like sections of bundles of the same rank, but different bundles, depending on the two versions. And then uh, the other thing is that the homological gradings will end up different. Like, there'll be different uh, twisting datum that are compatible with the, different, with the supercharges. So does S-duality swap the two? Yeah, S-duality swaps the two holomorphic top versions of the two holomorphic topological twist. Um, so let me describe the first one. Um, and so the, this first way of writing it is maybe the uh, least nice way, but it's the one that is nicest when you try and look at Lagrangians. So what you're going to do, so first let me just notice, uh, so if you look down here, uh, that C star acts on the one shifted cotangent bundle of BG, which is just uh, the quotient stack G dual mod G, where I mean linear dual there. And uh, it acts with weight two on uh, the linear functions on that stack. And in particular, it acts with weight two on the symplectic form. So there's an action uh, like that. And now once you have that action, um, then you can, if you have any space with a C star action, well then your square root of the canonical bundle that I've chosen, uh, like that is a C star bundle, like if I remove the zero section, so I can twist the space by that C star bundle. And then I can look at, and so that's going to give me some bundle of stacks over C cross um, C shifted, sorry, my curve C crossed with the complex numbers shifted by minus one. So that's going to give me some weird bundle. And then you want to look at the sections of that weird bundle. And there is a result of, and Ginsburg and Rosenblum uh, basically looked at this example, except for without the T, or sorry, without the uh, C shifted by minus one bit. Like uh, they were trying to look at some Lagrangians that Davide defined. And uh, they didn't quite describe the, the fields in this twist, but they came very close. And for the purposes that they wanted, it was the right thing to do. But, but for, to describe these fields, like you want this. And it turns out that um, depending on like what kind of a curve you've chosen, so if you cho chose like a punctured disk, it turns out that conjecturally that is a zero or e that that is a, when you choose this uh, canonical bundle, that will be a zero oriented thing. Um, this isn't strictly true because like there's not like a good theory for um, things like spec of Laurent series. Like there's not like a good theory of shifted symplectic geometry in AKSZ that works in this case, but I'm going to assume it will. And then uh, in, the, in the setting where you have a smooth proper case where everything is rigorous, then this C together with its canonical bundle is oriented of degree, square root of its canonical bundle is oriented of degree one, of dimension one then that C shifted by minus one is actually oriented of degree minus one. So you end up finding that you can pull that cotangent bundle through uh, the sections. Um, and then that'll give you this T star of two minus DA on the outside. And then if you think about what maps from C shifted by minus one are, well, that's just the one shifted tangent bundle. So you end up getting uh, like this equality and the, and the sec sections turned into just ordinary maps into BG because the C star action that I defined is not acting on the BG part, it's strictly acting along the fibers of the cotangent bundle. So like that's like one way of describing this moduli space. Um, but another word, like so if I were to complete this thing around uh, the zero section or the double zero section, then uh, this thing would be the same as the Dolbo stack of, of bungee, like the, the inside piece. And so you can actually like, uh, you can actually deform that to bungee Duram. And this is the way in which like D modules like actually show up, like uh, when you look at this geometric lens lens, like in Phil's formalism, is that like actually the thing you see is sheaves on bungee Duram 
Um, like it's, and like those things actually look a little bit more, if you look in a concrete model, they look a little bit more like um, modules over the Durham complex than they do look like D modules. Um, and like, so like it, when, so like if you're a physicist, like that's kind of the thing you would see if you like expanded everything out into fields. Okay. So any questions about this little piece? So basically the first set of, the first uh, shifted symplectic variety is the, holomor the equations of motion for the holomorphic topological A twist, and then the topological A twist is the second, uh, second thing that I've written down. Okay. Uh, similarly, the, the, the B twist fortunately is a little easier. Uh, so for the B twist, uh, you can write that as uh, T star three uh, minus db, where db is some number telling you how oriented the do, uh, c dol bow is, um, of t star of bungee of, of your curve. Um, and then you can rewrite that uh, as maps from c dol bow into t star shifted by three of bg. So now let me just like mention like really fast, uh, c dol bow basically looks like um, the one shifted the formal one shifted tangent bundle of C. Um, and so this is a one dimensional vector bundle over C that I have in the domain. And that's the exact same thing that I had uh, like in this other case, except for you notice the homological degrees are different. Like there it was a minus one, here it's a one. Um, and so that's this consequence of the two different twisting, uh, the two different twisting datum. And then you notice that uh, in this case I had sections twisted by the square root of the canonical bundle and here I only have maps. But now this bundle became non-trivial. Like the bundle, this is a bundle over C and it became non-trivial. So basically the, the forms got moved into the Dolbo is like what, what happened to things. And then this thing admits naturally another deformation where you can deform uh, C Dolbo to C Dol C to Rom in, in the source. And so this will give you a second um, uh, this will give you the B twist, and you can pull the T star three through again, and you find that this is just T star three of three minus DB of flat G of C. And so depending on what you've plugged in, um, either if you plugged in the disk, then the Dolbo stack will be one oriented. If you plug a smooth proper curve, it's two oriented. But the thing that you should notice is that in either case, three minus DB is always equal to one minus, two minus DA. So like if you choose the same curves, you actually got stacks of the same, same dimension. Or the same, sorry, symplectic shift. Um, for physicists in the audience, uh, if you plug in a disk, this is basically the equations of motion for 4dn equals 4 compactified on a circle and then looking at the rosansky witten twist. Okay, so any questions about that? Okay, so now, uh, like what we were looking for is we were looking for these interfaces uh, between different 3D, for, between different 4D n equals four theories with different gauge groups. So just remember like the picture that we were looking at here. Um, so we had these different brains and these things were interfaces between uh, 4D n equals four for gauge group GLN and GLM and these are the things we're trying to make sense of. And Phil told us that uh, that uh, interfaces are particular boundary conditions and boundary conditions are just Lagrangians. So now we're on the hunt for some Lagrangians inside of these stacks that I've talked about before. And so there's two theorems that you can use to produce a lot of Lagrangians. They're not the only two theorems, they're not the only way that I can get Lagrangians, but like two good ones are this AKSZ PTVV theorem that Phil described. So he just told you what happened if I had a D-oriented um, a D oriented space and then some N shifted symplectic stack. He told you that the mapping space from X to M was symplectic. But the other part of the theorem is that if you have a Lagrangian in M, then maps from X into that Lagrangian will also be Lagrangian. And so that theorem will let us produce, um, so this flat G is really just maps from C to ROM into BG. Or well, actually, sorry, th this. Sorry, actually, that's not important. The, uh, but the equations of motion that I wrote there for the B twist, like they're of the form, ma uh, they're a mapping stack. And so this thing will let you uh, produce Lagrangians in there from Lagrangians in, in uh, T star three of BG. 
But then the second, uh, the, but the second, the A twist was what are these weird section stacks? Like it's not really a mapping stack. And so Ginsburg and Rosenblum proved an extension of the AKSZ PTVV result where now if you have an additional C star action on your compatible C star action on your Lagrangian and your symplectic manifold, such that the weight of the symplectic form is L, then if you have a D dimensional, um, sorry, uh, where the dimension is computed with respect to the st structure sheaf, I won't say exactly what that means, uh, stack uh, together with an Lth root of its canonical bundle, uh, so now like I don't actually have an orientation, now I have this Lth root of the canonical bundle, then it turns out that the section stack uh, will still be, well if I do sections into M twisted by this Lth root of the canonical bundle, well then that will be symplectic and this other thing will be Lagrangian. So basically you can use this other version uh, to produce Lagrangians for the, in the A twist. And this is like what Gensberg and Rosenblum actually made the theorem for, is they were trying to describe um, something about something related to the A twist, uh, but like it, we're kind of doing something just a tiny, like an infinitesimal amount different. Uh, it's, it's literally is just like a thick, like a no potent thickening of what they're doing. So do they have a paper on this or? Yeah, it's this one like Gyoto Lagrangians. Uh, I mean, that's a, if you just search Ginsburg Rosenblum Gyoto Lagrangian. Um, but the important thing for you is that if you put in the bubble, and you do the A twist, then these things should be giving you uh, your ring objects. Uh, like after you quantize the Lagrangians. And then like the important thing is that they tell you like how to globalize the ring objects to, to like an arbitrary curve. Um, and then, uh, then like the natural question is, is like what's like the other, like what's the other object? What's the other construction? Of, of, a, of, of, a D or of an incoherent sheaf on low cis from a 3D n equals four theory that should be mirror to what you guys did. And like it's obvious what to do for the bubble, uh, like using Sataki, you can just kind of guess, but it's a little bit trickier like if you actually want to, um, but if you actually want to describe it on a global curve, because the obvious thing to do with Sataki doesn't work. Because uh, like with Sataki, right, you just use the moment map. Uh, of the of the S dual space. Anyway, we can talk about it later. Um, okay. So in summary, like what this thing tells you is that if I have a Lagrangian in T star one of BG, which is G dual mod G, then I can get, and it's C star invariant, then I can get something in the A twist. And in the B twist, all I need is a Lagrangian in T star three of BG. But in order to make the picture more symmetric, I want to actually introduce like an extra C star action on this Lagrangian, like on this space. So then there'll be a correspondence between like the two different kinds of data. And so what you need is you need to put a weight zero action of C star on uh, G dual mod G, one that doesn't act. And basically like loosely speaking, there should be, there's a transform of Lagrangians with one C star action to Lagrangians and the other C star action that roughly switches the C star actions and the homological grading. And that's basically the, uh, like what changing your, your twisting datum does. Like when you change your twisting datum, it just regrades everything. And, and like one of your degrees was homological and the other one was C star. And when you do the other twisting datum, it swaps everything around. Um, and like, and I would be actually like a little bit interested in a better mathematical description of like precisely like what this transform is and like what, what these objects are. Like in practice, like most of the objects I know how to build, it's obvious how to build both of them. But like to actually describe this like transform in like a rigorous way uh, is something that I wouldn't mind talking to people about. Okay. So then one big source of these Lagrangians comes from a theorem of Safranov, where he says that suppose that I have some n-shifted symplectic stack and it has a Hamiltonian G action, then like that should be the same thing as being, as having M mod G uh, be a Lagrangian inside of T star one of N plus one BG, where T star N plus one of BG is just G dual shifted by N mod G. So you're just modding out the, the, the moment map by G and that'll give you, a, and the fact that that's a Hamiltonian action will be the same as this other thing being Lagrangian. So in particular, uh, that tells me that Hamiltonian G actions give me a big source of Lagrangians um, because I can apply either the AKS, 
AKSZ construction or I can apply the Ginsburg-Rosenblum construction and basically like from this input data and I'll end up getting two things. Now in the case that, um, that I have G acting on some space X, well that's the same thing as a map from X mod G into BG. And then uh, you could make the Lagrange, well G will also act Hamiltonianly on T star shifted by N of X mod G. And that's another way of describing uh, the co-normal to X mod G in BG. And so basically like the theories of cotangent type with a G symmetry, like end up giving you uh, the co-normal Lagrangians inside of um, T star and plus one of BG. So like, like basically like you get like kind of like a nice like correspondence for those things. And so like that's like what this cotangent type hypothesis is buying you when you do this boundary condition thing, is it means you only need to quantize a co-normal and somehow that's an easier thing to quantize than quantizing like an arbitrary Lagrangian in a symplectic manifold. And so like the key like thing that like you need to do uh, is like describe like a quantization procedure for like other Lagrangians. Um, and maybe if I have enough time, I'll try and explain a little bit how to do it. But um, if not, we can talk after. Okay, so then let me just say a word. So these Lagrangians that arise from uh, Lagrangians inside of either T star one or T star three of BG, these are, the, these are precisely the boundary conditions corresponding to 3dn equals four theories with G symmetry. But there's actually, like when C is a punctured disk, there's actually like lots of other Lagrangians uh, inside of these equations of motion. Like one example is uh, there's something corresponding to the trivial, um, basically there's Lagrangians coming from 4D surface defects. And it's so like one example of those would be uh, the inclusion of the puncture disk into the disk induces a Lagrangian in the equations of motion. And that one does not come from a 3D theory. And like it's also, I don't think it has anything to do with like singular support conditions. Like I would like a way of like trying to like distinguish like which boundary conditions are surface operators and which boundary, which things are coming from uh, 3dn equals four theories. Uh, and like basically like, like the difference is, is right, if you have a 4d theory, you could take a 3d, th you could take a boundary condition and then compactify everything on a circle and then you get a boundary condition for the compactified theory. Or in this other thing, you're compactifying on a circle and then taking a boundary condition, but it didn't come from anything in 3D. And right, and like, so one of those things is describing surface defects and the other thing is describing these 3D theories. Um, so that there's like sort of like a difference in these things, but I'd like something like geometric that like lets you tell these apart. Um, I think that it ought to be something about being like kind of close in some kind of neighborhood of the trivial surface defect, but I don't really. I don't really quite have anything precise to say. Okay, so then now uh, we need, so now we have this way of producing uh, Lagrangians inside of T star three or one of BG. Uh, like the way that you need to do it is you need to find Hamiltonian GLN spaces or GLN times GLM spaces with nice C star actions. And like one, uh, and like basically like, I'm not gonna actually write them down for you, but the like basically the answer to this question is the bow varieties. Like basically Cherkis defined the correct guys for you to write down a long time ago. Um, Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm confused about uh, yeah. uh, the numerics. So, somehow, so you can see the shifted potential, but so, so now you, you have this uh, shift by one. Right, and, uh, yeah, so, the, uh, so, so, so let me, yeah, so let me just show you. So in this thing, if you have a T star shifted by N, the co-normal gets shifted by an extra one. Okay. Uh, so, so that might, so, so basically like if you have a, like an ordinary space, that'll give you something in the one shifted cotangent bundle. And if you have a two shifted thing, which is like hard to, t which would be like if you regraded using the C star action as your homological grading. Like right, all, all the symplectic varieties we're usually interested in have this weight two C star action. So if you regrade those things to make that the homological grading, then you'd get, then you'd have a T star two of X and then uh, that would be in T star three. Um, but there's something a little bit tricky. Like sometimes you could pick a C star action that violates, uh, that gives like fermions like an odd weight. 
uh, sorry, an even weight, and then like that like blows things up. And so there's like some restriction on these actions even beyond uh, like just being conical or whatever that I don't quite understand. Um, and actually you can compensate sometimes and then that like actually affects like the duality and I don't quite understand the way that that happens. Okay, but anyway, but the point is is that you have these bow varieties. Um, some of the interesting ones are like if you have um, an NS5 brain uh, between, uh, that was supposed to be an N and an M, then that's just T star hom from CN to CM. That's a natural piece when you're building like representations of a quiver. Like you see those guys all the time. Um, and then the interesting ones are when you have these D5 brains. And then like one of them, like Sasha kind of talked about a little bit in his talk, uh, although he was doing uh, a different twist where you have N on both sides in a D5 brain, and then you get this T star of GLN times C. Um, and then uh, the other one Sasha talked about a bit is like if you have a big step, so this isn't a single one, but like if you do this full configuration where you have like N, N D3s ending on a D5, then N minus one ending on a D5 stepping down all the way, then that's uh, the regular Whitaker. Uh, reduction of T star GLN on the right, and then you have your GLN action on the left. Right, <laughs> again, which is what the structure is saying. So, so you have a picture on the left, you have a picture on the right, you have some kind of variety. A variety with a What's GLN. The so these, so like what is the, so these things are supposed to be some Lagrangians in, um, Lagrangians in like maps from D star into B, you know, whatever. Yeah, let me, let me, I mean, I mean, yeah, 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 so, so basically, yeah, yeah, so like I have these two spaces, like where I make C, B, D star, or, or C, like it doesn't actually matter, like any curve, um, and so these are symplectic spaces, and then I also have these symplectic spaces, and what I told you is that if I have Lagrangians in the target, then I can, uh, then I can get Lagrangians in the total space, like, like in the whole mapping space or in the whole section space through this AKSZ construction or the Ginsburg-Rosenblum construction. And so what I'm saying is, is that if I, my input space, uh, like if my input Lagrangian is the ones corresponding to those spaces, then the Lagrangians that you get are the ones that are supposed to represent those brains. Like, 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 like those are the ones that the physicists sir, would write down. Like they, like, they would write down some Lagrangian in these spaces to be, like the, to be the D5 brain or the NS5 brain. And I'm telling you that the way that you build that Lagrangian is it's actually just built from something about T star of bungee, well, T star one of BG or T star three of BG. And then like you do this complicated construction and it globalizes it for you. Or like it, does that make sense? Um, so, so there's, there's just a procedure that they have, uh, yeah, that I, described, that I described a little bit about here that takes a Lagrangian in a target and then makes a Lagrangian into the mapping spaces or a Lagrangian in the section spaces. And so I'm just saying that like, so I was telling you in this picture, I'm just telling you which things to put in the target. Uh, you need to think of them with, you know, some GLN times GLM actions. Is it GLN times C or GLN times C to the N? Oh, C to the N, I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah, I made a mistake. But it looks to me like cotangent type everything. Uh, let's see. So here's like something really subtle. So they are all of cotangent type, or sorry, conormal, well, sorry, the, if you're looking at the A twist. But when you do this regrading operation, that I was referring to, that there's like something about like when you swap uh, the homological and the C star gradings, something that was of cotangent type might turn into something that's not. And uh, so like basically the B side D5 brains are not of cotangent type. And like that's like the sort of like the big, like the big obstruction to like making sense of this picture. And that's why you have to invent like a form of geometric quantization for shifted symplectic stacks that will do Lagrangians that are not of cotangent type. 
And so like this is like the main, like identifying like that object is like the main problem that we're interested in. Um, so unfortunately, right, these stacks, so there is like, kind of, well, it's very much in its infancy. Like there is kind of like a theory of geometric quantization for n-shifted symplectic stacks that's in the process of being built. But it does not apply to something as infinite as like when you put in a punctured disk. And so even, so like basically like, like there is kind of like a categorical geometric quantization procedure like for finite dimensional things or maybe for like locally almost a finite type type things. But like if you want to do it for something as big as that punctured disk, like, like, like the, there's nothing off the shelf that's going to work. Um, and, even the, and even the finite type thing is like, hasn't even been described in a paper. Like just Pavel's told us about it sometimes. <laughs> well, there's a paper of Wallbridge that does part of it. Um, um, okay. All right. So now I want to try and talk a little bit about this categorified geometric quantization. I had originally like written a different talk where that's all I talked about for the whole hour. And like still like I barely got through it. So this will have to be really brief. And really it wasn't like it's not exactly like my idea anyway. It's like some mix like of like there's some stuff that's like pretty obvious to do. And then like there was one trick that Pavel told me. Um, that, that fixes everything. But the, roughly the idea of this categorified geometric quantization is it's supposed to be some way of taking an n-shifted symplectic stack and producing a c-linear infinity n category. Um, for cotangent bundles, Phil told you what it did. The interest, the hard part of this problem is the second part, which is if you have a Lagrangian, how do you actually build some object for the Lagrangian that lives inside of the category corresponding to the manifold? Um, okay, so well, in particular, let me just tell you where things would live if you could do it. So Phil told you, like, if you have a two-shifted cotangent bundle, then you just get sheaves of categories over your, over your base. Um, and then there's some papers of Gates Gorey where he at least produces a functor into the category Sasha was talking about, which is either categories with a strong action of um, the loop group or categories living over quasi-coherent sheaves. Um, but there are different functors, actually, in this case. So one of them, the second functor is taking global sections of your sheaf. And the first one is actually taking the fiber over the trivial bundle. So like these realizations into categories are like, in, um, are, are like, di are like different looking realizations. So that actually like makes it really confusing sometimes to think. And so that's why I prefer to think in this other model where things are uniform. Um, but it's also true that like there's a bunch of like hard functional analysis issues that people sort of know how to fix these bottom two categories, and I don't think anybody has really any good idea of how to fix th them in the other like in the other realizations. But just for um, this is also what the physicists would say they would say the sheaves of categories thing, um, like because that's what Rosansky uh, said in his paper on Rosansky wooden theory. Um, and then, yeah, I should get a Lagrangian in that category. Um, and in particular, if you get a Lagrangian correspondence, you want to try and produce a functor. Like, that's the kind of thing you want to do. And then let me just make the statement of S-duality, and then I'll try and come back and tell you something about how geometric quantization works. So the statement of, like, what S-duality is, is that, like, if I have, um, like, the D5 brain, there are two different objects that I can produce from it, like an A-side object and a B-side object, um, by through this geometric quantization procedure. Uh, the only one that, that is hard is the B side D5. That's the only one that like, we don't know already. Um, and then uh, these things are functors between sheaves of categories on bun GLM and bun G, uh, e either bun GLM DROM and bun GLM DROM or LOCSIS GLN and Loxus GLM Durham, uh, or sorry, GLM, and they're supposed to be intertwined by local Langlands. Like, the, like if you use the local Langlands equivalences on both sides, you'll get a commutative square intertwining like the functor on one side with the functor on the other. 
So like the big problem is to identify like what on earth is the geometric B side geometric quantization of the D5 brain. Like that's the only object that people don't know, or that like isn't like within reach right now. Um, and then let me just say really briefly, like this Hanani Witten move that I was talking about, it's not very important what it is. It's just some statement about like an equality of compositions of functors like in the local geometric Langlands category. So it's something that can be checked. Like, I mean, like, I don't know that it's true. So is, is it some uh, relation uh, inside the group SL2Z? Uh, uh, no, it's, it's just about like moving these brains through one another. Like it's basically just like if you like write one configure, I'll, I'll write it down for you in a minute, but it's just something about like letting you, like I see in that first picture, I just took my first brain and I just moved it all the way through to the middle, but then I lost a, uh, then like I lost some D3 brains when I moved it. So like, uh, so like basically like what you should do through this picture is I'm supposed to be taking that D5 brain and moving it through the NS5s and somehow that can't kills some of the D3s. And what this is supposed to be telling you is that each of these configurations is just telling you some composition of functors. And like the Hanani Witten move is an assertion that those two compositions are the same. And like, Nakajima's actually already proved something sort of similar like this at the classical level about the bow varieties. And if geometric quantization actually commuted with composition of Lagrangian correspondences, then the classical thing would give you like the, the quantum statement for free. Like, I mean, that's like very far off. Like that's not like gonna be a good way to prove it. You could probably find like a way of proving it directly like much faster. I'm just saying that morally, like if one were trying to like build the program that's gonna take like five years or whatever, like that's what you would do, is like you, you, would, try, you would try and prove this statement. Okay, so now, um, well, let me just say really quickly, there's a similar statement relating the 3D n equals four gauge theories and the 2D n equals two two theories with G symmetry on the boundary. And like Telemann has talked a lot about this in his ICM, and like Sasha has like some results about like computing um, the quantum, the equivariant quantum cohomology of like the flag variety this way, and I have some results about some other in terms of Coulomb branches, um, and like that can all be kind of like interpreted in this picture, but it's the same exact type of argument. It's just about a field theory and its boundary. Um, and this is kind of what I've been working on more with Tudor. Okay, but now let me try and like make a statement about like what geometric quantization of Lagrangians is supposed to be. Okay, so let me just like tell you some recollections on um, geometric quantization in general in the ordinary setting. So you have M being some zero shifted symplectic manifold, and I really just want to think of it as being smooth. Um, and let me notate the symplectic form. Then in order to do geometric quantization, so in this case it's supposed to give me a vector space, there are two extra pieces of data that you need to choose. So the first thing that you need to choose is a polarization. Actually, let me do the pre-quantization first. So the first piece is something called a pre-quantization. And this is just, you're supposed to choose some line bundle with connection such that the curvature of uh, the connection is equal to the symplectic form. The second piece of data that you're supposed to choose is you're supposed to choose a polarization. And uh, this thing is, uh, and I'm only gonna talk about real polarizations because um, that's the only kind I, I would need to use. So this thing is just some Lagrangian uh, foliation of the cotangent, or sorry, of the tangent bundle of M. But let me like give like a definition of this that could like possibly generalize. So what this thing is, this Lagrangian foliation, is it's just a Lie algebroid uh, that, in, that includes into um, the tangent Lie algebroid. 
And then, uh, and this. Of cells, not of oh, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, the foliation is on M. The distribution is in TM. Yeah, sorry. So this thing is supposed to be into the cotangent bundle of TM. Or into the tangent bundle of, no, tangent bundle of M, sorry. Tangent bundle of M. Sorry, that's right. And what this thing does is that you can take the Durham complex of M, which is the chevely eilenberg complex of this Lie algebra, and the map sigma induces a pullback map to the chevely eilenberg complex of F. And then your symplectic form is something in here. And uh, the condition that this thing be Lagrangian is just asking that this pullback be equal to zero. So, so your map will take this uh, to this. Um, okay, and then now let me just really quickly tell me tell you how you change this. Like if it's n shifted, so this isn't due to me. This is due to, well, the prequantization part is due to Wallbridge, and then the Lagrangian foliation stuff is, I think, an unpublished work of Tony da uh, Panta, Damian Kalak, who are your other two collaborators on this? Uh, Beckley and Zizian. Uh, okay, so those are the the people who have been working on Lagrangian foliations in the derived setting. So they have worked out like what the definition of a Lagrangian foliation is, and basically the only change is it's still a Lie algebroid, but in the derived setting, it doesn't make any sense to ask for a map to be injective, so you just have to say it's just any Lie algebroid um, uh, with this property. So you can still make sense, even if this is a derived stack, you can still make sense of the derived Durham complex. Um, and then you just have to upgrade these things to being from the stacks of closed forms, like, and then you can, and then change this to being a homotopy, and so everything like goes through like just just fine in like the n shifted symplectic setting, and then the part that's due to Wallbridge is like how do you change this prequantization, and like roughly like the like roughly you change this for a gerb with connection, with a so the right. Thing is that if you're n shifted, you want to get an n gerb with connection. Uh, I can say a little bit more about like precisely like what that means, but let me just sort of not. Um, and so there's some sort of higher curvature map for these n gerbs, and you want it, so you, and I guess like there you want it to have a two. I, I, the numerics are a little off for me. Maybe you want it to be a one. One connection. So, like, basically, like, there's higher, like, you can choose how many forms you want in, in your connection, and then you want the curvature of that gerb with connection. So there's like an n curvature, and you want that to be your symplectic form. And then now, if you want a compatibility between your prequantization and your polarization, uh, you just need to lift this path between. Basically, you can make sense of um, a kind of cohomology which classifies these n gerbs which is a small modification of this chevely eilenberg complex, and you just have to ask for a lifting of this um, equality, or this path to a path in that other complex. So that part's not very interesting. Or, sorry, I mean, it is interesting, but that's not the, uh, not the part that I think is exciting. Um, but let me just really quickly tell you what the geometric quantization would be in this case. So the geometric quantization would be um, with all of this data is you can take M and then mod out by your foliation. The fact that this thing has a curvature, uh, like has this connection, this gerb has a connection that is your symplectic form, and that connection is being uh, is flat along th this condition that the curvature is zero along the foliation tells you that your bundle is flat along the foliation. So that tells you that your gerb actually descends to uh, this quotient space. Uh, so let me call my gerb G with connection. And what you want to do is there's a canonical sheaf of quasi-coherent N categories on this thing, which I'll call N Qco, which isn't really very complicated to define. 
And then you want to twist that by the gerb and take the flat sections. And this is the definition of the higher quantization of a symplectic manifold with a foliation and a, and a prequantization. This part is not very interesting if you, but you'll see that in the zero case, this reproduces uh, the prequantization that you would have had before. The part that's really exciting is the following. So if you have a Lagrangian inside of your manifold M, uh, let's call this I, then uh, if you pull back your foliation uh, along I to L, it turns out that this thing is actually a symplectic foliation of, de of one lower degree. Uh, so this one's an N minus one shifted um, symplectic foliation. So basically, like, so these Lagrangians, w oh, okay. Oh, I'm about to finish, I, like I can't like do the whole story. Um, and the point is, is you can polarize, this thing you should think of as just a family of symplectic manifolds of one shift less. And then one can polarize that family and pre-quantize that family compatibly. And by quantizing that family, like that is what is supposed to give you the, uh, the, uh, the sheaf. Like the fibers of the sheaf, so like the key example is like if this thing is like a one shifted cotangent bundle of X mapping onto X, uh, sorry, let me do a, yeah, one shifted cotangent bundle is fine. So then you could have a Lagrangian here. So the composition of this Lagrangian um, with this projection map, um, that is actually like a family of symplectic manifolds living over X. And if you geometrically quantize each fiber, that's supposed to give you a vector space. And if you take one vector space for each fiber, that's exactly like a quasi-coherent sheaf on X, which is what you wanted to get. Now, like actually like going through and like making this like real is very, very difficult. And you need like conditions on your Lagrangians in order to be able to do things. And there's functional analysis problems and it's really gross. But at least like the idea seems somewhat promising. Yeah. Questions? And I guess like the biggest thing with Phil that, that we've been doing is in the global case, there's a few Lagrangians that you can actually try this procedure on to see if you get things that the geometric Langlands people have seen. So, so in this, this corner that you said you isn't known, there were like four things and they were... Yeah, that's the, well, yeah, so basically if you do that on a curve instead of on uh, the disk, so on the disk, like there's no chance of any of this working, the technology's not there right now. If you do it on a global curve, like things become like rigorous and still like there's not a knowledge of what that object is. Or maybe there is, but um, I, I don't know it. This gives, you an for guessing. this gives you an onsatz for guessing what that object is, and one could try and like check that with what's known about the global, uh, uh, sorry, known about the global Langlands correspondence. And that, and really, the reason I think it's exciting is because it's a test as to whether categorical geometric quantization is nonsense or not. I mean, Pavel has a lot more tests, so he knows it's not, but. This is like a hard, but I mean, this is just like some, something you could try and see whether it actually works in that case. In the 3D, 2D thing, is it compatible with the Telemann proposal or? Uh, it's slightly different. I mean, it, it's very close. Um, he, he mainly actually talks, uh, he doesn't compactify in a circle first. Um, and he uh, and he also like doesn't uh, he does so we're doing like this Durham thing he does a Betty version so so there's like two ways in which our, our like our thing ends up being different than than, than Telemann but I mean like he wouldn't be surprised other questions let's take Justin again.